You're listening to Talking Freely, where we discuss culture, politics, and religious freedom. Talking Freely is a podcast from Freedom for Faith, a Christian legal think tank that exists to protect and promote religious freedom in Australia. Welcome to Talking Freely. My name is Rowan McHugh. My guest today is Dr. John Dixon, who's starting out as a singer-songwriter, now works as an author, academic, and media presenter. In 2007, he co-founded the Centre for Public Christianity and has published 18 books and three TV documentaries. His latest book is entitled Bullies and Saints, an honest look at the good and evil of Christian history. John, welcome to Talking Freely. Hey, good to talk to you, Ron. Given that you've already published many works about Jesus and the church in history, what compelled you to pen this candid survey of Christianity's checkered past? Uh, Probably because people increasingly think that Christianity has only damaged uh, the world, has only raped and pillaged through history. And that impression that religion, particularly Christianity, poisons everything, has become so widespread that uh, an Ipsos poll in 2017 found that six in 10 Australians agree that religion has done more harm than good. And so we are, we are uh, one of the world's most pessimistic when it comes to appreciating the value of religion. And so that's the context in which I've just been doing a lot of thinking about, you know, why do so many people uh, have this view of the church? And combined with my... Um, student of history cap, I can see (laughs) why um, people who have dipped into history might conclude that uh, Christians have done lots of harm. And it only takes a few very sceptical writers to pluck some stories from the past, you know, the Inquisitions, the Crusades, the Salem witch trials and so on, uh, to leave an impression because you know, the rest of those two centuries are basically a blank in in most people's minds, that if you're left with these three or four or five examples of Christians behaving badly, that stands for the whole thing. It's emblematic of all that Christianity gets up to. So it's thinking that through and being disappointed with a few of the defences of Christianity that I have seen uh, come into print and elsewhere uh, that are sort of overly defensive or uh, hide some of the truth or, uh, you know, try their best to do sort of a whitewashing that inspired me to just offer what seems to me an honest uh, account of Christian history, honest about the failures. And I think equally it has to be honest about the gifts of Christianity to particularly the Western world. The view of early church fathers like Lactantius is one of toleration towards religion and conscience. How do you understand the value of his appeal to conscience and its role in our time, given it's often seen as that which only enables bigotry? You know, it's interesting. Lactantius uh, followed Tertullian a century or more earlier, uh, the other great father over in Carthage, in, in thinking that Um, At the heart of genuine uh, religion, let's just use that word because they're happy to use it, um, is the will. Um, And they're they're not at all interested in the arguments about, you know, free will versus determinism. Their their, um, key point is the, the heart of good religion is a relationship where there's a willing party, the gods, uh, and another willing party, uh, creatures who enter into a relationship. And so uh, they reasoned that you can't possibly force a relationship. And so the uh, best form of society, uh, you know, that wants to promote religion is one that allows people to um, fall in love with the God or the gods uh, or fall out of love with the God or the gods and people should be able to persuade each other. And so Lactantius has this wonderful argument um, in, his, in his book, The Divine Institutes, where he, writing in the middle of persecution, he says that pagans must be really insecure about their gods and their traditions if they have to force us to try and follow their traditions. If you have to force us on pain of death 
to offer, you know, incense to your gods, then obviously you don't really believe in your gods. Whereas we, we believe in the true God. We believe he's your God too, but we also believe he wants a relationship with you. So we believe in the toleration of all the religions. It wasn't just that they were, you know, nice lefties. Uh, and they were in many ways really radical right wingers, certainly Langtatius and his view of sex and those sorts of things. But on the question of what is religion? He was adamant that it has to be a thing of the will in order to be a thing of relationship, of love. You trace a line of religious toleration from the church father Tertullian, who just mentioned, mm. to Thomas Jefferson, <laughs> the latter who endorsed the former's view that, quote, it is a fundamental human right, a privilege of nature, that every man should worship according to his own convictions. One man's religion neither harms nor helps another man. It is assuredly no part of religion to compel religion, to which free will and not force should lead us. How instructive are these maxims in our day and age? And to what extent are they complicated by our unique cultural challenges of secular worldviews? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> mine is not a book that's going to solve uh, those dilemmas. Uh, but what I'm trying to unpack is that this recent secular argument about freedom of religion, which Thomas Jefferson really kicked off in the United States, was a borrowing from uh, not just the secular natural rights tradition, uh, John Locke and so on, uh, but it reaches back clearly into the Christian tradition, which emphasized um, that if religion is a thing of the heart, it must be therefore a thing of the will, and therefore you can't impose religion. Now, um, in, in today's world, we have a lot of people trying to sideline religion. And my view is that the same tools and rules should apply that Tertullian and Lactantius uh, commended. And that is basically prayer, prayer, uh, service um, and uh, persuasion and uh, often suffering. And so um, the early church did incredibly well with prayer, service and persuasion and, and often suffered. Um, but so did the medieval church. And I think the modern church thrives best when it, it resorts to persuasion rather than engages in the mere politics um, of, you know, just getting numbers and doing backroom deals and uh, the kind of bully behavior that is the norm of our politic, but I don't think should be the norm for those who believe in a, a Christian view of, uh, of religious freedom. Carl Truman, in his latest work on the modern self, examines this quote from Jefferson a bit more closely. He believes it to be limited in our modern age, where the harms mentioned are being reimagined as status harms to marginalized groups. What's your view on this and how can the church engage well under these conditions? Well, you know, with all of these um, problems of society and religion, there's a, there's a truth and there's an exaggeration. Uh, the truth is there are um, harmed minorities and it is uh, hopefully at the center of uh, any Christian's view uh, that genuinely harmed minorities uh, need to be cared for, especially. And so uh, the, the principle that God has chosen the poor, uh, you know, to shame the rich and so on, is a principle at the heart of the Christian faith. Um, Christians are the one who, ones who believe that God entered the world in a lowly human being and died on a cross and experienced shame for the sake of the other. Um, and so there is a truth that we must be using our persuasion for minorities that are harmed, that are genuine victims. The problem is with any truth, um, it can be exaggerated to the point where people merely claim harm and claim uh, sort of minority uh, suffering status and use that as a cudgel. And it's interesting that it only works as a cudgel because of Christianity's influence on our culture. I mean, that is not a cudgel that would have worked in ancient Rome at all. I mean, if you tried in ancient Greece or ancient Rome to say, look, where the where the minority weak, you know, weak and poor, uh, Romans would say, well, therefore nature intended you to be discarded, right? So it's Christianity's influence uh, that has now come back to bite it because Christianity says, no, we really want to listen to those who are injured and, and a minority because God cares for the lowly. Um, and people now rush to this argument um, to sort of claim a righteousness in a, in a kind of perverse way that I'm righteous if I'm a victim, and this is used to beat down 
the Christianity that gave it its philosophical undergirding in the first place. I'm curious about your view on blending the Christian life with cultural and political engagement. In a country where a Christian view of goodness is on the wane, how can the church be careful not to fall into an under-realized eschatology, failing to confront evil or protect the innocent, and embracing a kind of que sera, sera fatalism? Well, one of the things, one of the lessons I draw from ancient church history, um, and I'll always answer a question like this, uh, you know, in my happy place of ancient history, um, is that it was precisely because the Christians were so confident of their truth um, about all things that allowed them to be a little um, more relaxed and gentle. So when you look at Tertullian's um, treatise to Scapula, the governor, where he argues uh, for this principle of freedom, um, it isn't that he thinks Christians are slaves and just have to let the culture have its way. Um, it's clear when you read his, his letter um, that he thinks the other religions are false and harmful and ridiculous and that Jesus Christ is Lord and scapula will face the judgment of God. Um, but, but it's his profound confidence in these realities that allows him to be gentle so that he only uses persuasion. The same is true of Lactantius. If you read Lactantius, he, he isn't writing as a cowering slave class minority that's persecuted. He, he, he really sounds like he thinks he's already won. And the fact that he's already won, that Christ has already won, that Christ sits on the throne actually gives him the freedom to think it's only through persuasion that I can bring people into conformity with this. This is a long winded answer to your question, but it's, it's crucial for my way of thinking about this. And that is we should stand up for everything we think is the good. It's just that we should do it with a gentleness and respect that uh, relies on persuasion and service and prayer. So it'd be fair to say that your view of unhealthy forms of public engagement for Christians are those that fail to prioritize persuasion and uh, graciousness. I think so. Um, when backroom deals are made, you know, like a backroom deal where uh, we urge a politician, uh, if you vote for us on this, we'll support you on that. I think those kinds of things are sub Christian. Um, I would much rather everything was done out in the open and that persuasion was was the key and where christians lose the persuade lose the debate uh the public persuasion then christians are gracious uh they are good losers but which i do not mean you know they crawl back into their hole and keep quiet i'm of the view that um the opposite of the bully behavior is not quietness. It is good persuasion. And so I, I try and plot a path between the quietistic view that some Christians hold um, because they're embarrassed by noisy Christians and the noisy Christians who are happy to use all the tools of politics to get their way. So somewhere in between those two poles, I think is a more exciting, freeing, Christ honoring, God trusting approach to the public good. There's a common idea today that religious freedom is merely ensuring people are free to worship in private. From your perspective as a historian, what is wrong with this view? <laughs> um, religion isn't private <laughs> I mean, and never has been. Um, and and this, this was the case uh, in ancient times as well. Uh, religion was never private. Religion was public. I mean, the argument of Porphyry, the great um, third, early fourth century uh, pagan philosopher against Christianity was precisely that it was a threat to the social order because we all know that the gods keep Rome safe. And so these traitors that are leaving the Roman gods in their you know, tens of thousands um, are going to bring the downfall of Rome. And people thought, oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And uh, a great persecution resulted um, uh, from Porphyry's argument. Um, and, and so Lactantius, in his reply, agrees that religion, of course, is um, public. It's about the public good, um, as well as you know, individual faith. Um, but the good is best served through persuasion. 
My basic answer is religion has never been private. It is a very modern um, uh, invention to think of religion as private because um, certainly in the case of the Abrahamic religions, it involves uh, how you spend. It involves uh, looking after the poor and the marginalized. Uh, these are all about politics in that broad sense of, of the word politics. And so Christianity is fundamentally political. It's about how to live in community in the polis. In the book, you mention a law passed by the Emperor Justinian in the 6th century, a flat-out ban on non-Christians teaching academic subjects at the highest level. You spoke of it as the end to religious freedom. What lessons can Christians learn from the era of this for our time? Not to be bullies. Um, I mean, I have enormous regard for Justinian. Um, I think he did so many wonderful things um, and made churches uh, places of immense public good with hostels and hospitals and all sorts of things that were you know, designed for the public good, the good of the empire. But he, he thought that um, false religion was corrosive and must be cut out of the empire. And a big part of this view, um, if I may do a little bit of history, is that following the conversion of Constantine a couple of centuries earlier, um, so we're talking 312, 313, uh, there was a period of toleration right up to when the emperor died in the late 30s, uh, 330s AD. And um, that uh, principle of toleration, uh, the principle of Lactantius, uh, was disturbed when in 361, there was the pagan emperor. So, so having had a couple of Christian emperors, suddenly there was a pagan emperor who tried to wind back the clock and um, wound back the clock on religious freedom too. He pulled privileges. He sacked um, any Christian who was a professor of rhetoric in the, in the Greek schools and the Roman schools. Um, and although he didn't um, create uh, an environment of violence against the Christians, he certainly sidelined them sacked them all from imperial office and so on. Um, he, he also, under the cloak of health measures, uh, banned people going to churches. Um, now, um, that could have, humanly speaking, wound back Christianity so far that the reaction of the emperors after Justinian, uh, sorry, after um, Julian, emperor, pagan emperor Julian, was uh, the, the response was to say never again. And so in the late uh, fourth century, you get this new vision of muscular Christianity that says never a Julian again. And Justinian is the pinnacle of that. Uh, his, his view is we know what happens if you give pagans an inch. So let's not give them an inch. Let's exile them and so on. Um, but I actually think that the, the principle of toleration, even if it um, leads to um, persecution and so on, is the best principle. And I think persuasion is the tool that Christ has given the church. The Morrison government has promised a religious discrimination bill by the end of the year. What kind of protections do you think the bill will need to include if it genuinely seeks to safeguard religious expression in the spirit of Tertullian and Lactantius? Yeah, that's a hard one. I, I really hope it's got a broad approach um, so that it isn't, it isn't phrased simply as Christians are allowed to say they think marriage is only between a husband and a wife. Um, because I don't want it to be simply a Christian or simply an Islamic quirk. Um, the, the fact is there are many non-religious people who think really the only form of marriage that makes sense on um, sort of natural law grounds is between a man and a woman. And um, I, I fear that they won't be able to uh, share their view because it's not under the cloak of religion. So I actually don't want uh, it to be too, although we need it for uh, religious people, I think this kind of freedom to speak uh, what you regard to be true and to act in accordance should apply equally to religious and irreligious people on, on questions like marriage, 
on transgender and so on. And, and I'm a little bit worried that people will go, oh, those religious people with their weirdo religious protections, why should religion have these special protections, et cetera, et cetera, when actually I think the head of the atheist club should be just as free to say, look, if you think about it, uh, good natural law arguments would uh, lead to the view that one man, one woman coming together for the nurturing of their shared offspring uh, makes a lot of sense. Now, that's the old Roman view, incidentally, on marriage. The Romans were um, not at all religious in their view of marriage, but they certainly made a natural law argument that marriage could only be between a man and a woman. Um, and yet that wouldn't be protected if, it, if this is just a very targeted shield of protection for the religious. So I don't know how, I don't know how to have a religious discrimination bill that... Uh, effectively protects religious people, but also reflects just garden variety Australians who for maybe not religious reasons, share the view uh, of religious people. The same is true on a, a topic like abortion, another super hot topic, right? It isn't just religious arguments that make um, abortion questionable. Um, there are plenty of natural law philosophers who are adamant that uh, abortion is the killing of an innocent human being and is morally problematic to um, put it lightly. Um, but would they be protected uh, from making this philosophical view if our legislation is simply giving a cloak of protection to the religious? So what I'm saying to you is I am all for these religious protections. I think um, th this is good for society for people to be able to persuade uh, on their view, but I don't think it should be only religious people who are protected by it. John, thank you very much indeed for speaking with me today on Talking Freely. Absolute pleasure. That's it for our latest episode of Talking Freely. If you'd like to get in contact with us, you can do so through our website, www.freedomforfaith.org.au. Freedom for Faith exists through the generous donations of individuals and organisations across Australia. If you'd like to financially partner with us, you can do so through our website.